The next one from me is another nanotechnology journal because it was just all go in the nanotech world this week. Um, on top of everything else, this is in a journal called Nano Letters, which is another very good nanotechnology journal, and it deals with something that most people will probably be quite familiar with, spider silk. Yes. So for a long time, we've known that spider silk has some pretty weird properties, and we've actually had a reasonably good idea of why. So um, silk proteins, once you break silk down into its simplest components, are essentially big flat sheets that are kind of rigid, uh, hooked together by kind of bendy bits. Mm. Now what this group did is that they have figured out that most of the nanostructured materials that we build are good, but they're only good if they're really, really well made. So you don't have many tears, you don't have cracks, you don't have imperfections. And usually if you're doing that and you get an imperfection, usually you have to junk whatever you've made. Um, this is a big problem with superconductors. Mm. You can't uh, join two together because of the small imperfection at the joint. So silk's not like this. No. Silk is full of tears and cracks and, and cavities. So these guys have been studying silk to find out exactly how it compensates for all these cracks and is still something like four times, um, has four times the tensile strengths of something like Kevlar. And the paper is very detailed, so I'm not going to go into it, but they've resolved the general mechanism and essentially they just have big squishy bits <laughs> at the end of the long flat sheets, which is very, very cool. Fantastic. Um, yes, it's worthwhile watching. I'm just double checking on the names of it. Yes. It's either Small Worlds or Invisible Worlds. It's a BBC um, documentary that they did about tiny, uh, well, at the Invisible Worlds, so they use high speed cameras for stuff or they look at very, very tiny things with all kinds of microscopy. And one of the things that they look at is spider silk. And they actually show some very interesting images of the structure of it sort of down at the nano level. It's it's extraordinary stuff. And of course, now people are trying to, to say, well, spider silk is fantastic. Can we do better? <laughs> They're sort of getting there, well, <laughs> which is kind of cool. We've got goats to produce spider silk in their milk, so that's a, a step. I know, spider goat, <laughs> it's fantastic. Spider goat. <laughs> Precisely. Um, right, moving along to, to something a little bit different. This is, when was the last time you were zoned out? I'm thinking if you aren't zoned out right now, in which case, hello, welcome back. Um, I'm sure it was fairly recently. It's something that human beings seem to do out a lot, uh, do a lot, and... The, I, the thought is that it has, well, it's hooked into our being conscious and, and being self-aware somehow, but we're not terribly sure why. Scientists think basically it serves a key function in our survival, but, you know, mm. And so they thought, well, let's have a look at some of the lower uh, animals out there and see if they show this behavior as well. Now, zoning out comes from a, a part of the brain called the default mode network, or DMN, and it's about 10 networks of brain regions which are active when a person is at rest. And so it, it, what is interesting about it is that it's active when a person is letting their mind wander, but then basically shuts down as soon as that person is given an external task, well, at, at least in people. Now, it looks as well as if this is happening in monkeys, and even more interestingly, in rats. And, well, now that it, it's causing even more conversation because it suggests that monkeys and rats, I'm not going to go into all the details of the research, um, there's a very, very interesting article on it, but the interesting thing is that it suggests that monkeys and rats may actually have some sense of self, which is particularly interesting. It, it's not a sense of self maybe the way we know it. I don't think they have the same sort of horror on the existential <laughs> plane that we so often battle with on a Sunday afternoon. Um, but, but certainly very interesting. And, and so we'll, we'll again be watching to see what they do with that. But uh, yeah, interesting. So and and zoning out is 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 a good thing. Certainly, it, um, they're thinking not only may it be involved with sort of a sense of self and things, but it, it helps with laying down memory. So you sort of, you know, when your mind wanders, you go over past experiences, you think about interactions you've had with people or something that you've done. That's actually quite good at at uh, concreting memories down. Mm. Oh, that's fascinating. Mm, I know. Interesting to see where that goes. Yeah. Talking of zoning out, Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in Nature this week, in Nature News, an article was published um, talking about the U.S. Intelligent Advanced Research Projects Activity, or YARPA. 
as yeah, opposed right. to DARPA. So these are the US intelligent community uh, that monitors things like social networks and buying and selling and yeah. the stock markets and all of these bits and pieces. And essentially what they've done is they've opened up a, uh, a group of proposals. They've said, uh, propose to us how you would monitor this so that you can predict the future of human actions. And particularly this is in regard to things like Occupy Wall Street, um, financial markets, obviously, things like riots, and they're wondering whether you can do this. And they've had a whole slew of repons- responses from all different sectors, from computer scientists to physicists to financial analysts to everything in between. Hmm. And it's actually, it's, it's really, really cool on one hand, and it's kind of terrifying on the yeah. other. Um, my favorite part, it's a really well-written article. I would actually recommend you read it because it's, it's quite short as well. But my favorite part is, is the big question that comes at the end is... Um, <laughs> Sorry, Robert, a guy called Robert Albro, uh, an anthropologist at the American University, points out that just because the data's there doesn't mean it's good quality. And when it comes down to Twitter, yeah, I can kind of see where he's coming from. So it will be interesting to see how that monitoring goes. Um, and see what they can predict out of it. Absolutely. I'd, I'd certainly be very uncomfortable if governments, for example, were using it to tamp down on perfectly legitimate protests. That's, I think, where it starts to scare a lot of people. Yeah. It's certainly an interesting problem. Mm. Um, yeah, cool. All right. Uh, another one is, well, this is interesting. So there is consistent chatter and, and research going into autism. Now, we know a couple of things about autism for sure. We know that the MMR vaccine, for example, does not cause it. So that's good. But we don't know exactly what does cause it. There's ongoing um, sort of debate around whether it's caused by genetics or environmental influences or possibly some conjunction of the two. Now, researchers from the University of Missouri say that they have found distinct differences between the facial characteristics of kids with autism compared to kids who are developing typically. The reason that this is interesting, um, and I'll get into the details and what it said first, uh, a little bit later rather, is, is basically if they can pinpoint when a child starts becoming autistic, they may be able to better pinpoint what is causing it, whether it's a genetic or an environmental interaction of some sort. So, so that's potentially very interesting. What they did was they took, um, I think it's around 60 children, but don't quote me on that, and uh, pointed a 3D camera at them and, and captured a three-dimensional um, image of each child's head and then mapped 17 points on the face. Um, they then calculated the overall geometry of the face using these points and they found significant differences. So apparently autistic children have a broader upper face, including wider eyes. They have a shorter middle region of the face, including the cheeks and nose, and they have a broader or wider mouth and philtrum. Now, the philtrum is that, that divot, that little dent between uh, your nose and your top lip. So, um, mm, uh, interesting. Yeah, that's, oh, that's really, really cool. And, and I think that, not, not that autism is, is per se always a bad thing. There are many people out there, particularly with um, stuff like Asperger's or upper level ASD, who, who are very happy and would have it no other way. But uh, with some of the, the more severe types of, of autism, it would certainly be good to be able to identify it as soon as possible and see what we can do with it. And we should also note that this is quite a different discipline to phrenology, which is that old yes. school measuring the distance between <laughs> your the calipers, eyes and yeah, yeah, with the calipers. Where, where you could have the skull of a criminal, but the nose of a pianist. <laughs> In your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, maybe. <laughs> yes, then that's kind of a dead giveaway. Okay, the next one for me is something that's been coming out for the last few years. So, um, 20 years ago, 1987 or thereabouts, we discovered these weird things called high temperature superconductors. Ah. So, conductors are things like copper, uh, good at conducting electricity, um, you have low losses, and that's why they're all good. So, good ones are copper, silver, gold, you know, all the expensive metals. Mm. Um, a while ago, we discovered superconductors, which are just metals that are ridiculously good at these things. Sorry, they're not metals, necessarily. Um, and in 1987, we discovered high-temperature ones of these, the joke being that high-temperature superconductors work at 200 degrees below zero as opposed to 270 degrees below zero. Which does make a big difference. <laughs> and since then, there's been lots of interest and research going into them for various different reasons, and we've ultimately divided them out into two camps type one and type two Mm. type one you can't put a magnetic field through it 
Straight up. Type two, you can, but weird things happen to the magnetic field. Oh. Now, this year, or over the past couple of years, um, an article that's been published in Physical Review B has just shown a, a fundamental theory for a superconductor to exist that's halfway between type 1 and type 2 um, which is extremely strange because there's not a well defined theory of superconductivity no. but what this theory says or extrapolates is that there should be if we can find these type 1 and a half as they're called mm. superconductors which is very very strange um, and it's it comes down to vortices of magnetic fields <laughs> forming inside the superconductor itself and I probably don't need to go too much more into Ooh. it than that you can we can find and read the paper online yeah. um, it's freely published if you want to take a look but essentially the message to take home here is superconductors are weird we still don't understand them and we don't even understand the types we think we understand but we have more now <laughs> yes um, yeah, we're very interested in them, uh, if nothing else, because there's no energy loss, they're, they're perfectly efficient, um, resistant, doesn't get in the way, they're a much better way to shunt electricity around, um, and they can do some like truly awesome things as well, like ridiculously cool stuff. You can make magnets float on them, or you can make them float on magnets, there's a wonderful video doing the rounds at yes. the moment on YouTube, quantum levitation, quantum locking, yeah. um, which is, the quantum locking aspect is a bit of a misnomer, but the levitation, the float in the staying in position is very, very epic. Cool. And the, the idea is, is the better that... I mean, we're able to make superconductors, and some of the people here in New Zealand are, are actually known as some of the, the top in the scientists world. in doing that. But until we actually have a valid and a, a working sort of theory of exactly how superconductivity works, it's going to be difficult to get them really good, particularly since everybody's trying to get them closer to, to the holy grail, which is room temperature superconducting, because the energy required to keep stuff that cold <laughs> is intensive. <laughs> I should say that on the, because um, I work out at the same building as the high temperature superconductor yeah. research people, on their door, it just it sums up the theory of superconductivity for me. They've just got this little picture, and on the top it says, fundamental theory of superconductivity and underneath it's got a picture of a penguin swallowing a frog <laughs> <laughs> and the frog is labelled superconductivity and the penguin is labelled magnetism and you just look at it and go what? Yes. you realise that's the fundamental theory of superconductivity <laughs> just not sure yet but, but fantastic that uh, that stuff is starting to come through absolutely um,